We're going to give everybody a couple more minutes to, to sign in. Uh, it's Craig Anderson with AFL here and uh, looking forward to this session. So just a couple more minutes and we'll get started. Good day, everyone. This is welcome to AFL's webinar focused on splicing user training. I'm Craig Henderson, your presenter for today's session. It's a pleasure to have you all here. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my co-pilot, Magda Garlapetti. Magda will be uh, assisting me directing your questions to me throughout the session. Please feel free to submit your questions using the webinar chat feature, and we'll address them as we go along. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Mega Mega Shankarla Party. Thanks for joining us, uh, people who are just joining. Uh, you, uh, the question uh, and answer is open throughout the webinar. Please post your questions uh, so that we can answer uh, as we go through the webinar. Okay, today's agenda. We're going to be looking at safety, some fiber background. What is splicing, how it works, set up before splicing, the splicing process, common problems and scenarios, splicer and equipment maintenance, optional accessories and support. Safety. Um, first of all, I'd like to note that our safety situation with this is paramount, paramount at AFL. We acknowledge that you got a lot of risk. Uh, this is mainly going to be focused on the points to consider during the splicing process. Uh, the first point that we are dealing with here, we got a high voltage electric arc. Uh, that being present, uh, uh, cer certainly want to be cautious of flammables in the workspace. Try to have a little bit of ventilation in your splicing bands and whatnot. Uh, second to this, uh, we're working with live networks. You might have an active fiber. Be careful with your eyes with this. Don't look directly into that fiber end. It could damage uh, your retina, so to speak. Uh, moving forward, uh, definitely want to use a inspection scope as you see in the bottom left-hand corner. The third thing I would like to mention is fiber shards. Uh, this is a, a common problem in the industry when you are uh, working with a splicing band or a workstation. Uh, don't ever take your hand and swap it over the top of the table. Uh, I remember traveling back in the day, getting in splicing bands and helping people work on their systems. And I boarded the cloth chair like it was up the plague. It's just very dangerous uh, and move away from that type of material. Try to use vinyl if you can and stay away from the cloth seats. Little stuff like this really helps. Some fiber background information. First you'll see here is understanding fiber. The parts of a fiber, you have the core, which is a glass, a cladding, which is also glass, and then the coating, which is typically a UV acrylic material. One thing I will mention here, what is one micron? This is something in the industry that's uh, hard to, to get people to realize how small one micron is. 
I like to use the analogy of uh, a particle floating in the air, and, you know, a light ray hitting that particle. If you can see that, that diameter of that particle is probably around 20 microns. What we're trying to align with a single mode fiber is typically going to be a nine micron core. And that 20 micron particle floating in air certainly could create havoc for you. Unfortunately, in a field environment, you're dealing with a gazillion, millions of particles, so to speak. Planning diameters uh, typically are 125 micron. This is imperative for fibers loading into V grooves, making sure that you uh, have a tight fit in those uh, mechanisms. Additional buffer coatings, again, the, the bare glass, as we call it, would be 250 microns. In today's fiber, it can also be 200 microns, and they're considering moving the end of the industry down to a 180 micron coated fiber. But that being said, this material sometimes is up-jacketed with uh, various materials to get into your cable structures, loop tube cable structures, ribbon cable structures, uh, that type of stuff needs to be considered. A little bit about uh, understanding fiber and age. Uh, over the years, fiber has gotten much, much better as uh, quality has improved. Uh, one of the main things you experience with fiber is this core cladding concentricity that you see on the screen, where the center of the cladding is not necessarily where the center of the core is. Uh, this is uh, can attribute to loss, and it's something you have to consider with the splicing systems that you that you use today. One thing I would specify is the age of the fiber. Uh, you can see here with the corning fiber that we're dealing with in 1990, uh, approximately less than one micron of concentricity within that core, and it's approved over time. But that being said, what happened in 1990? That was actually the introduction of the first uh, fixed D group mass fusion splicer. So within the industry, anytime you ask yourself about cable quality, it's very important that you ask when was this cable manufactured? If you say 1990 or earlier, you might want to consider using an active uh, plant alignment system or an active core alignment system in that scenario. And certainly would recommend going the uh, way of the core alignment. We'll explain that in just a moment. Another thing you have to consider with uh, planting diameter tolerances, as you can see here, if it's uh, 125 micron and both those fibers in a fixed V-groove system are sitting in a fixed V-groove, they will be in uh, the same plane and you thus would get good cladding alignment in a fixed V-groove machine. A smaller diameter it was set deeper into the V-groove and it's just an illustration on the left, uh, the far right hand side of that scenario being too small or too big. You'll notice here, worst case scenario with the specs that were mentioned, a 1.4 micron of core offset is about as much as you can expect with this type of phenomena affecting you. Understanding fiber. I'd love to show this little image because a lot of times we speak in uh, fiber with four diameters, we'll say 50 micron core, 62.5 micron core or even a nine micron core. In reality, the fiber wave as it's traveling down the glass is actually transmitting a little bit in that interface between the core cladding layer and you have what we call mode field diameter. The mode field diameter is larger than the core diameter. An example of that is you see in front of you. So um, how do we splice it? What is a splicer and some of the terms associated with that? A splicer, what is a splice? The joint of two optical fibers. The fusion splice, optical fibers where they have been fused into a single continuous fiber. The fusion splicer is a welder that is mating those two fibers together with a high voltage arc. Requirements of a fusion splicer, fiber control, fiber alignment, viewing system, heat source. Uh, today's splicer 
They use modern technology to meet uh, fusion splicing requirements, fiber control, fiber alignment with degrees, viewing system, uh, high-end optics, and a heat source, high voltage electrical arc. Main components in the fusion splicer. What you see here is a top view of our FSM 90S series fusion splicer. Uh, this is our active profile alignment system, a single fiber fusion splicer. So the main components of this are the left and uh, right fibers loaded into the sheet clamp assemblies. Uh, these particular machines uh, can be retrofitted to use uh, fiber holders that you would similarly or relate to mass fusion splicing, but these coming to you from the factory would have these sheet clamps. The fibers lay in a D group. Uh, I will talk a lot about the B groups themselves, uh, very small, and uh, that's one of the elements you have to uh, keep extremely clean. We just want to make sure that when we're dealing with the fusion splicer, that these beep grooves uh, have the highest level of cleanliness. The viewing system up under the electrode, you will actually see objective lenses. Uh, you have a dual view objective lens, an X and a Y. And these all periodically should be cleaned only when you fill a dust check. And we'll discuss that a little bit later as well. The Camera LEDs, this is the back lighting mechanism of the fiber to illuminate the back of the fiber. And then of course the heat source, the electrodes themselves, you have a cathode and anode electro, positive and negative electro pins uh, to produce your high voltage discharge arc to heat those uh, fibers together. And of course the tube heater, tube heater shrinks the, the protection sleeves and gives you the uh, ability to uh, protect your fiber after the uh, splice is completed. Different kinds of splicers. Active client alignment. Uh, this is uh, what we normally associate with the last mile style fusion splicer, where it will align the cladding edges and not necessarily see the core. You have active core alignment. This is systems that have been in play since 1986. Um, active profile alignment systems high magnification, uh, can actually see the core. And then of course, mass fusion. Uh, when you get into high uh, capacity splicing, uh, lots of fibers to do in a single day, you would consider a mass fusion splicer where you could splice up to 12 fibers simultaneously. Fixed feed group. Uh, these are similar to mass fusion. They have a mobile V grooves uh, fixed. And as a result of that, um, they're on the lower end of the spectrum as far as product offerings that are, are available today in the market. How it works. What you will see here is the groove alignment. And again, uh, two systems that would use the groove alignment would be a cladding alignment fusion splicer and a core profile alignment system fusion splicer, the mass fusion splicer, and the fixed D groove single fiber splicer, uh, this element is not in play. The B grooves again are fixed. Fibers are held by three points of contact. I stress this a lot during my training with uh, service techs in the field. It's critical that the elements that come in contact with the cladding be extremely clean. The uh, Surface of the cladding is clean with a high grade VH of grade alcohol and can wipe lint through wipes. Uh, that being said, when that cladding comes in contact with the B grooves and the B groove chip clamps, it's imperative that this stuff uh, be extremely clean. Uh, again, fixed B grooves are motionless, uh, active, as you can see here. They can move in a XY pattern up, down, left, right to position the cladding or the core into maximum alignment. The viewing system, uh, just to understand when you're dealing with a cladding alignment system, the cameras are motionless and it will see the outside cladding edges, but it can move those swing arms to align those cladding edges based on an X motion and a Y motion of those B groups. And as you can see here, the LEDs, uh, that's pretty much a 
backlight mechanism to illuminate the backside of the fiber. So as that light as that light passes through the fiber, it will be projected onto the objective lenses. For alignment, these cameras actually move. Since you have a high focal point, high resolution camera, you can move the X, uh, the Z motion of the cameras, and you can drill down and actually see the cording, as, the core as it resides in the clamp. Profile alignment system, as I stated earlier, it's been around since 1986. Uh, and this is the basis of the day's high-end active profile alignment systems. Here's the beauty with a mass uh, with a active profile alignment system. The image that you see on the screen here uh, is magnified approximately 165 times, and you can actually see the core in the cladding. Those two shaded lines in that gray area is the core itself. Uh, you can only see that with a high resolution, high magnification system. In order to do this, you've got to move those objectives in or out to uh, localize that focal point so you can get that resolution so you can analyze the fibers themselves. Uh, misalignment of these are, can be caused by debris on the fiber interface, uh, large cleave angles, arc that is out of calibration. So uh, all this stuff we use control with the maintenance menu. And also would mention uh, from loss estimation, you can see here it says dot zero, excuse me, dot zero one dB loss estimation. You use this in conjunction with what your eyes are telling you. So this is the center of the splice point. You have your Y camera. This is the splice point. You have your X camera. This is the splice point. So you're looking at two angles that are 90 degrees uh, facing off from each other, but you can determine quality not only by the estimator, which is very accurate, real time, you can see it with your own eyes and, and you can see any type of defect that would be present at that splice point. That's one of the big advantages of a active profile alignment system. Cladding alignment splicers, they look very similar to the active profile alignment system. The bright region that you see in the shaded area, that is not actually the core. That is where that collimated light from the LED is being bent to the center portion of the image. So that is not the core that you're seeing. That is just the uh, bent light being reflected to the center of that core region in this particular case. The estimators in uh, this scenario this particular case are not nearly as good as they are with the active profile alignment system. It is basing its uh, loss estimation on clad alignment, how well the clad is aligned both in the X and Y axis to produce that uh, estimated clean law. You'll notice here when you're talking about misalignment uh, can still be called by all the same things you have with the active profile alignment system, but the fourth one poor core cladding concentricity. Uh, this particular mechanism, these types of systems cannot see the core and therefore cannot catch this core cladding concentricity error that might be in, in effect. And there's also, as I mentioned earlier, loss limitations on not being able to see the core in the, in, in the image. What is the splicer? Mass fusion, fixed D groove. Uh, as you can see here, the image, you have 12 fibers instead of one. Uh, you'll notice again, you have that bright region that looks like the core, but it is not the core. And uh, the fixed D groove systems, they're very sensitive to uh, geometry tolerances, debris. Uh, we, uh, we have to be clean with a single fiber system, of course, but with mass fusion, you have to be really dialed into proper cleaning, neck, cleaning techniques of prepping these fibers before you ever get to the splicer. The loss, the loss estimate accuracy with a very similar to what you would see with mass fusion fixed V-group machines, a a cladding alignment machine. 
set up before I splice it. The systems today have a high level of features that are ingredient, ingredient, integrated in the system for optimizing speed and efficiencies. To fully leverage these features, the technician uh, operator must invest and comprehend what these functionalities are doing for you. It takes some time to understand this, but to be perfectly honest, uh, what we're trying to do is to increase efficiencies. Hindsight being 2020, when we first introduced the 90 series fusion splicer, in my opinion, we had the initial from the factory set up too fast, and the machine was uh, wanting to push the operator at a level of speed that he was not comfortably operating the system. And in hindsight, what we should have done is slowed those systems down a little bit and allowed the operator skill levels to advance. And then once those skill levels advance, we could speed up the time for the wind protector to close, the time for the machine to start the process of splicing. Uh, that being said, uh, this uh, triggered the closed reaction time get the known machine and set it up for your everyday splice rhythm. I guess my point is, don't want to be too slow, don't want to be too fast. You just want to kind of work it into what best works for you in the field application. It takes us a step away and that's always nice. It uh, reduces uh, a little bit of fatigue in the splicing process. Hope that makes sense. Uh, choosing the splice mode. Uh, splice modes according to the five year splicing. As a rule of thumb, please recommend for uh, folks that have these machines in operation is to have a fiber that you have success with, uh, like a match clad single mode fiber that you spliced 100 times. Have a little bit of that fiber in your uh, splice box to use just in case you're uh, questioning where the system is working properly, you can pull out that standard, so to speak, and use that uh, to your advantage. Uh, some of the things about the splicer and the auto designations uh, within this splicer, as you can see uh, within these systems, you got SM Auto, NZ Auto, and uh, Multimode Auto. This particular function for you is gives you the ability to choose the best splice parameters based on the fiber type you're working with and auto calibrate your system throughout the day's activities. And this is, we always recommend that you do an arc calibration the first thing in the morning, uh, but throughout the day, if you have uh, some barometric changes as a result of uh, weather patterns coming in and out of your particular region, uh, this machine will pick that up and um, make some micro adjustments to your arc power. Uh, that being said, uh, some general designation of fiber types below, uh, SM, single, standard single mode, SMF fiber, uh, multi-mode, uh, MM, NZ, non-zero non dispersion shifted, DS, dispersion shifted, and of course, uh, BIF, BIF, being insensitive fiber. And I'm sure there's some more that are being developed today that we're going to have to uh, set up a recipe to splice those properly. So, uh, hey, Craig, so we got a question here. Uh, someone is asking what to do, how to set up your splicer after a period of not using it. Will they still go to the same uh, splicing setup what they do? So the question is, if you have your splicer on the shelf for two or three weeks or a month, when you bring it back, into operation, what are some of the things you would want to do? Uh, certainly would want to give it a good cleaning and we'll cover the cleaning steps in a few minutes. Uh, and secondly to that, you would want to perform your art calibration or a diagnostic test that we will cover in detail a little bit. But absolutely would go through those uh, types of processes. Now, another story, what happens when Joe has the sponsor one day and then uh, Peter might pick it up the next day. Uh, Peter, you can't trust Joe. You're gonna have to go out there and uh, go through these same mechanisms. If it was sitting on the shelf a month, you would do the same thing if you received it from a, another person. So good luck to you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, 
special modes, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Pricer has, I think, 40 or 50 preset modes that you're allowed to choose from and uh, calibrate and set into your system. So once you have these modes loaded into your splicer, it's a simple uh, mechanism to highlight the modes that you want, hit uh, reset, and uh, at that point, you're ready to go. So uh, I got one more question here. So what happens if uh, they use a multi-mode fiber when they have a single mode auto splice setting on? If, if they'll ask that question, if it's a single mode mode you're using, you put multi-mode fiber in? Yes. More than likely, you're going to get a dusty fiber alarm. The splicer is uh, looking for that uh, single, mode, single mode core and it cannot see that single mode core. So it's assuming that you have some type of film or something on the glass that is causing the image not to produce the detail that it needs to make that assessment. So you more likely would get a dusty fiber alarm. Okay, that's very interesting, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to choosing the correct heater mode. Uh, that being said, as you can see here within the splicer, you've got your standard FP3 60 millimeter sleeve here, which is mode number one. You have the shorter sleeve, the uh, 40 millimeter sleeve. Uh, so this is really comes back to the type of splice protector sleeve that you would use in the system. A uh, very simple operation to switch to the mode that you would like. In the case of having like, this is the Fujikura FP3 60 millimeter sleeve, but if you use a generic sleeve that may have more mass, this mode would probably be a good starting point. But since the, the other vendor sleeve may have more mass, you will have to make it longer. You never adjust your, arc, your heating profile temperature, only adjust your heating profile time or your heater mode and make that slide adjustment. So it's just a matter of highlighting this or clicking on this pencil, go into the um, details of that particular mode and adjust again, the time of heat, not necessarily the temperature of heat. The splicing process. I like this image because of the image that you see on the left here, this is a photograph of a repair for somebody sent a machine in repair and you can see the splice leaves along with some chem wipes uh, and I don't know what else is in this box, but be very cautious of not contaminating your splice protector sleeves and getting material into the internal structure of your splice protector sleeve. Uh, that being said, uh, you want to make sure it's clean, gel-free, the 900 micron or 250 micron coated fiber that you will slide the sleeve over. Just make sure that this material is clean and you don't have uh, that type of foreign matter involved. It could create some bubbling in your uh, heat sleeve and some of that stuff may happen. Just be a little bit cautious with it. Uh, here are some uh, typical splicing uh, tools that you would use. You have your mechanical stripper. Uh, you'll notice here you strip approximately 30 millimeters or an inch and a quarter. Uh, this would be used for 250 micron coated fiber, 900 micron buffer. And this again, when I say 900 micron buffer, we're really talking about uh, up jacking the material that would be in a fiber optic connector or some type of um, uh, patch panel, uh, patch cord or something of that nature. Then you get into ribbon structure where you would have a ribbon matrix or a ribbonized cable. At that point, you would need to use a hot jacket stripper and this little heating element here would apply heat for you and allow you to get the UV coating acrylic to release from the, the cladding of the uh, fiber and ease of stripping should be uh, a little better for you with that heat being applied. You'll notice here, link is set at the yellow zone in the thermal stripper. You can see this little area. Uh, 
I typically will set it up to where the strip length is right at that edge. I'm a big believer in shorter strip, strip lengths produce e easier fiber prep and cleaning and uh, cleaving at that point. Cleaning of fiber, a uh, big believer in using um, a reagent grade alcohol or a cleaning solution, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, when you go to clean this fiber, you would take a chem wipe or a another type of lint-free wipe. You would wrap it a lot. I see a lot of folks wiping it once. I recommend a minimum of wiping it twice. I will wipe the fiber, rotate the fiber or the wipe 90 degrees, wipe it again, making sure I'm getting the whole circumference of that glass clean. Uh, then here, change tissue frequently. I've been in locations where somebody will use a chem wipe half the day and I'm kind of scratching my head. Uh, the cheapest thing in fiber optics is the chem wipe and you certainly want to replace those in a timely fashion. Uh, this rule on the bottom, cleanliness in general, number one reason for splicing failures, uh, and you can ask veterans in this uh, job, it will bite you constantly. It's something you always got to pay particular attention to. Okay, so is using ethanol much worse than using alcohol? The the normal rule of thumb that I use for cleaning materials is I will take that cleaning material on a lint-free wipe and I will go to my home mirror or a glass surface and I will wipe that surface. And hopefully the, the fluid that you're using immediately evaporates and it doesn't leave any streaks. If that material, you can wipe it pretty quickly and it doesn't leave a streak and doesn't leave a film, you're usually in pretty good shape. I would also highly um, advise not to use acetone. Acetone is a pretty good cleaning agent, but the problem with that, if you have any residual acetone on the surface of the fiber, it will get onto your cleaver pad. That rubber will get attacked by the acetone. It will degrade the rubber and cause some problems in that area. So try to stay away from the acetone and some other of those cleaning properties such as that. Thank you. Here, uh, the cleaver, uh, it's funny with a cleaver, I, I always tell folks that, you know, one tenth the cost of a fusion splicer, but in reality is 50% of the splicing process. Uh, it's gonna be used to produce a flat fiber end phase. It's critical for splice quality, and it's the last thing you do before you take it to your fusion splicer. So when I was traveling and doing a lot of road work, I was also a service technician back at the factory when I was doing repairs and I would leave the plant and I would say, hey guys, you can use the rest of my material, but that cleaver, I would put it in a lock box and put it under lock and key. I was the only person who ever used this because once you are in this um, industry for a long time, you will realize that that cleaver is the key to quality splicing. Talking about the cleaver a little bit, question, uh, mega has got a question. Yes. So, is it a good practice to clean post cleaving? Uh, certainly is not. We have an image I'll show you a little bit later, okay. where you have a you you clean a fiber, you cleave it. Once you have that fiber cleaved, you will pre float that, not contacting it in base on any surface from the overhanging the cleaver pad to overhanging the V groove in one motion and not contact that end base on anything. Or you get the dreaded bubble and anybody has splashed in the world uh, any more than two days has gotten a bubble in their splice. 99.9% .9 of the time is contamination. Okay, going back to the cleaver, uh, splicing setup, comparing uh, the fibers. The cleaver is all about balance. And what I mean by that, you'll notice here the cladding is extended across the cleaver pads. There is no coating up underneath the pads. If a coating is up underneath the padding, you're gonna have uneven balance. You're gonna get a bad cleave. If you got gel compound like cable gel or some other slick surface on the pads, it's gonna create a balance. It's gonna cause a poor cleave 
as a result of that in plow. So make sure that cleaver is clean, the cladding is clean going into that mechanism. Uh, what will happen is the blade will score the fiber, the anvil will drop down and uh, after that blade scores the bottom of the fiber, the anvil will press down, bend that fiber and that crack will propagate across that, creating your cleaved end base. Uh, how to splice. Uh, very simply put, as I mentioned earlier, you go through the strip clean cleave process and you will load that fiber, the illustration here, B group edge, electrode center. You'll notice the end phase will fall right into that window. When you're dealing with a active uh, profile alignment system or a single fiber uh, system with sheet clamps, you will have to manually load that fiber in, as you see here with the index finger and thumb locating that end phase. And be very cautious not to hit that end phase. With mass fusion, this is done by the mechanism of fiber holders. It's actually very simple to load a fiber when you're using a fiber holder system because it will auto locate that location of the end phase as a result of dropping the fiber holders on these two pins. Very simple operation. The splice. Uh, notice here uh, when the fibers come in, you have the option of having the pause on or off. It's kind of funny when I'm doing a demo, I always turn the pause on so I can discuss uh, what's happening with the splicer because it goes so fast. But if I'm in a normal operation mode, I would have the pause turned off so it would go from setting the gap setting, aligning the fibers, producing the fusion splice. Uh, the loss estimation, as you can see, will appear here. Again, this is an active core alignment system, and all you folks that are looking at this splice, you can tell me if that's a good splice or not, just by looking at the fiber image. A little note about applying the splice protector sleeve. When you go to put a splice protector sleeve into the two feet of a fusion splice, what do you notice with this uh, person holding the fiber? Notice how taunt and straight that fiber is. He's actually doing the splice, he's taking that fiber and locating the two feeder, but he's holding it under a fair amount of tension. You really kind of can hold that taunt. A fiber handles tension very well. What a fiber does not like is buckling and bending. That's normally when you break a fiber, when you buckle and bend the fiber. Uh, so don't drop it into the tube heater and just let gravity feed it. Hold it under tension, push it down, let it engage the uh, switch mechanism to close and sandwich that spot protector sleeve between the two heating elements, and uh, you're off. You're off and running. Easy to do. Common problems and scenarios. I like this segment quite a bit. Uh, by far, the number one thing we get is what's causing bubbles. A bubble. <clears throat> usually is derived from a contaminated end phase. You remember me starting the uh, the webinar about talking about dust and debris and one micron. So these little particles you see on this end phase, that's your nine micron core. That's approximately a, a nine micron core in a single mode fiber. You can see these particles, and this is not particles. This is where a fiber has been wiped and there's alcohol residue that's evaporated on the end base of that fiber. As a result of this, when you go to fuse the fibers together, this material will start to burn, but it's a real quick pre-fuse time where the fibers are being softened, and then they will push together. When they push together, that particle is still there. It still has moisture. It's still expanding. As a result of that, that's the creation of that bubble. If somebody calls me and says they're getting bubbles in their splicing, and again, the majority of the time it's a contamination issue where they might be hitting the end phase or simply just dragging the fiber back out of the cleaver and contaminating the end phase by not pulling the fiber straight up out of the pads of the cleaver. Little, little things like this can create havoc for you. A little bit more about bubbles. Uh, you might see a little bit more with multi-mode fiber. Uh, the way multi-mode fiber is 
is made. It's got more dopants in the fiber. It actually melts at a lower temperature. And you have to have the parameters set up correctly in order to, um, and then mainly it's a longer prefuse time, but certainly you can call AFL and we can help you through that process if you're getting bubbles with your multi-mode fiber. You got single mode fiber, I'm gonna be more inclined to think it's a contamination problem with you, Frank, but there's some rare cases where bubbles occur by the fiber you're splicing or possibly something going on from a maintenance perspective with the electrodes. This is an interesting image. Um, what is the problem here? Uh, believe it or not, it might be an anomaly where you got a fiber A supplier, fiber B supplier, and you have a mixture of the dopants in the A and Bs, creating this line between the splice. So there's no way to tell if this is a cold splice without doing your arc calibration and making sure that the fiber, the machine is melting that fiber the correct amount. Very common to see this type of splice when you're splicing A type fiber to B type fiber or an A2 fiber to a B3 bin insensitive fiber. Uh, so don't be surprised when you see this, but if you do see it, I highly recommend that you do an arc calibration just to make sure that the machine is uh, calibrating and melting those fiber correctly. Now, earlier we talked about stripping the stripper, but you can take an inch, an inch and a quarter of fiber from a um, pigtail material. In reality, if you're able to do that, you're able to strip more than a half an inch of the 900 micron coated material off of that fiber. You may not be dealing with a tight buffer 900 micron. You may be uh, working with a 900 micron loose buffer fiber. And this is strictly where the, nine, the 250 micron coated fiber is floating in a furrication tube where you got the 900 micron outside diameter, but the inside diameter is much larger than 250 microns. And there's a lot of space associated with this. A lot of times you see this associated with fan out kit assemblies where you're going in, you've got a loose tube fiber and you're putting a fan out assembly on a mechanism to put on a fuse connect or possibly some other device in a central office environment. Very common that you would see this loose buffered fiber. We have several uh, mechanisms in place to um, adjust this or correct with this, but really what's happening within inside the splicer when you look at a fusion splicer, the sheet clamp itself is clamping on the outside buffer so it's not grabbing the 250 micron coated fiber underneath that 900 micron buffer. So as the Z motor moves forward, the buffer will move forward, but the fiber will not move forward and you'll get a ZL motor overrun. It's a kind of a funny thing happens sometimes with this because you're building up a lot of tension, a lot of pressure in a 250 micron coated fiber. And it, sometimes it will just all of a sudden release and it'll blow across the screen and move all the way across the screen. And that's because the 900 micron is not tied to this 250 micron coated fiber that resides underneath it. Uh, sometimes it can be a problematic for you. Luckily, we have some solutions for that. Uh, uh, Craig, will the hoop test break a cold splice? Say that again. Will, that, uh, will the proof test break the cold splice? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a tricky question. Sometimes if it's very cold, if it's a cold splice and it's very cold, when you hit reset, it will pull the fibers apart and they look like two clean fibers. Sometimes it's fractured and it looks like a broken fiber. So it's variable. I wish I could say there's a etched in stone comment to that, but it's a variable comment. Uh, as you can see, with common problems and scenarios, we've got. Um, different things to work with the 900 micron loose fiber. These sheet clamp assemblies uh, within the 31S, 41S, and now the new 3545 series of uh, swatchers, you can buy an external sheet clamp. And if you look here, 
there is a small hump or bump in the middle of that sheet clamp pad. You can also see it that's incorporated into the 90S series splicer. When you flip this switch from green to red, that bump will elevate and that will serve the best description I can, it's like a clothes pin. It's coming in and it's pinching that 900 micron coated fiber and it's deforming that 900 micron wall to go down and grip the 250 micron coated fiber. So we do have mechanisms to uh, correct this. Matter of fact, if you buy a 90S series splicer off the shelf, this sheet clamp assembly is uh, installed into that splicer. And of course, if you got fiber holder, we have a little uh, loose tube, a uh, 900 micron fiber holder assembly that would grab the 250 coated fiber under this portion of the clamp and the 900 in the back side of the clamp. And if all else fails, you can go to a little compression sleeve outside the splicer. This is a little mechanism when you slide the wedge closed. It will collapse the wall of that 900 micron. Again, it will adhere the 900 micron tube to that 250 coated fiber. Common scenarios here, classic example of contaminated beet root. This is actually a customer's unit was sent in for repair complaining about actual offsets. Uh, the reason for this is the 250, the 125 micron cladding fiber is not riding on the walls of the V groove, they're riding on contamination in the V grooves. Uh, cleaning V grooves uh, correctly resolves this issue 99% of the time. Bluetooth, the machine has uh, capabilities. Some of the devices now have Bluetooth capabilities. This will maximize the uh, Blade, blade life. It will also help your efficiencies and confidence with the splicer. This technology is uh, something that was introduced to the last models, and we're learning every day how we can influence our accessories with communication with our software packages. So I'm sure there are more features and mechanisms at play that will, will be offered in the near future. Blade life. Uh, always talking about blade lock management with cleavers. Uh, as you can see here, the cleaver has three levels. It's at the low level, the medium level, and the high level. It will start out on the low level, and you will work your way across the uh, blade wear. And you may get 800 cleaves on this first level of uh, cleaves at the low level. You might get uh, 400, 700. But as you go to the blade position number two, you should see that dramatically increase and get over 1,200 cleaves per blade position. But this is all about maximizing the life of that blade and have some mechanism to realize where you're at on that blade if there's a particular position that is giving you problems that you may want to avoid. Uh, this is available through that Bluetooth management software. A little bit more about Bluetooth. I'm not going to cover this too much. Uh, as with any device that you're dealing with with pairing, you have to go through the various steps to ensure that you have the items paired. I uh, strongly recommend that you kind of read your instructions and kind of go through that process and learn those procedures and, and be patient with it. I know uh, when I go to connect my headphones to my PC, uh, it can drive you mad sometimes. So uh, give us a call if you run into any issues with this. Splicing equipment and maintenance. A little bit about uh, cleaver, as I mentioned earlier, it's one tenth cost of the splicer, but it's 50% of the splicing process. Uh, I always tell technicians how many things come in contact with the cladding of the fiber. And if you look at a cleaver, it has six components that come in contact with that blade. It is the pads, you got your left, right, lower, left, right, upper, the anvil in the center and the blade itself. So there's six elements that come in contact with that cladding. And within the fusion splice, there is only two items, the big groove themselves and the big groove chip clamp. So all your focus is on this cleaver from the standpoint of hygiene and cleanliness. 
making sure you have the right tools. A uh, little bit more about the blade lock. As you can see here, 16 position blade, three heights. Uh, you should be able to get 60,000 single bar per cleaves, 5,000 ribbon cleaves. Uh, here, thermal stripper. Uh, you can use a toothbrush. My personal preference is a two inch paintbrush where I cut about a third of the bristles off of it so that paintbrush is stiff. Great cleaning tool to remove debris that may accumulate on your rubber pad or on the blade itself. And also you can always resort to Q-tip and alcohol to clean this area. But usually uh, a toothbrush or a two inch paintbrush with bristles cut off works great. Uh, same thing with fiber holders, the grooves in the fiber holders. If you ever have to deal with uh, cable gel, you've got to be very cautious to get that gel off the fiber. If it does accumulate on your V-grooves, it's going to slip uh, during the stripping process. You're going to have issues with the uh, coating protruding out too far on your fiber holder. And this in turn will cause cleaving issues. So pay attention to that. Make sure that material stays clean as possible. A little uh, B groove cleaning kit. This is very helpful and highly recommended for mass fusion splicing. Again, because you're dealing with uh, 24 grooves in the mass fusion splicer and you're trying to uh, find those particles, we always uh, telling uh, people on our repair work that the B grooves were dirty. And we have customers sometimes that push back and say, I know I've cleaned them. They're trying to look at it with a naked eye. And the problem with that is you really can't see the type of debris that we're talking about. And the cleaning kit is handy because it's got a little white LED pin light and a jeweler's lube that magnifies the fiber about 30 times. Uh, again, here's the B-groove. That's the jeweler's lube I was talking about, magnifying the fiber uh, before and after cleaning. Uh, camera lens cleaning, I, I would recommend removing the electrode housing so you can gain access to the lens. As you can see, this particular image, the electrodes have been removed and it gains access to that lens for cleaning. I will say that I would only clean the lens when it failed the dust check. You have a, Some people have a tendency to over clean and the active cleaning can produce some macro scratches on the surface of the lens. And if you clean it too often, you're going to end up having a maintenance bill where you'll have to send it in and have that ejective lens replaced. Uh, arc calibrations, as I mentioned earlier, uh, daily arc calibrations are uh, recommended. And then using the auto arc calibration, uh, certainly helpful. I would specify when you're using auto arc that you use the auto arc specified for the correct ITU spec that you're working with. And this can be uh, tricky sometimes. If you've got two different dissimilar fibers, this auto mode, uh, I would not recommend it using it. I would probably use an SM to SM mode and avoid the auto arc calibration altogether due to uh, uh, some mechanisms at play. We'll be happy to discuss those with you. Electrodes. A uh, good example here, uh, hard to say what happens to this electrode, but you know, we recommend cleaning your B-grooves. If you just accidentally hit the electrode with the Q-tip or some other material, you possibly could knock the silicon oxide off the tip. And what will happen with that is the arc will take the path of least resistance and um, could be detrimental to you and cause an unstable arc. The only solution at that point is to uh, stabilize your electrodes or replace your electrodes at that point. Uh, also, we don't recommend cleaning electrodes. We would actually uh, use them for 5,000 arcs for a single splicer, 1,500 arcs for a mass fusion splicer. Once that cycle has completed, we would discard them. If you attempt to clean the fiber or attempt to clean the electrodes, you may actually remove metal. And this gap distance is predetermined. And if you, that gap distance increases, it's going to create uh, a hot arc and it's going to create an unstable arc. 
So we do not recommend that you uh, clean electrodes at all. And make sure you're getting uh, the correct genuine Fujikar electrodes with our machines. Uh, there's some knockoffs out there that we've had problems in the past. Electrodes, uh, simple replacement. Uh, they are, takes about eight to 10 minutes to uh, replace those and stabilize the, the electrodes once you have them installed. The stabilization is simply putting fiber across the, uh, the making the splice, letting it arc on that fiber and build up silicon oxide on those pins. Diagnostic test, this was brought up earlier. Uh, if you've got another person using the machine, this is always a good thing to run through just to validate the machine is calibrated. You don't have to send it back to the factory for calibration. If you can get through all these different tests, you should be good to go. Uh, no reason to return it to AFL for service at that point. So, uh, Chris, is it good uh, if you do the diagnostic, the diagnostic test and calibrations uh, at the start of every session? And or as the sessions are going on into the entire day, like let's say for 24 hours, or is there any predetermined timing I should follow for this? I would recommend doing, and again, when I say diagnostic test, really the one that you would be concerned with would be our calibration. But if you ever get into questioning the maintenance or the condition of your machine, the diagnostic test will run through the various checks that we validate at the factory when we're doing repairs. Well, if it gets through a diagnostic test, you're pretty much ensured that your machine is working correctly. Motor, uh, arc calibration is one of those things is based on the fiber you're working with that day and the environmental conditions that you're dealing with that day. So those uh, are daily type uh, routines at that point. Okay. Battery upkeep, uh, as you can see here, Try not to store them in extremely cold or hot temperatures. Uh, do not try to charge extremely hot or cold. Uh, battery life is roughly 500 charges will decrease uh, if not treated properly. And of course, the splicer, if it's plugged into your AC supply, should and still operate. If it does not, it's a maintenance related issue and uh, have to call the factory service center for that. Four minutes, so we're gonna do the dogs, uh, quickly jump through that, we're gonna move on. Uh, accessories, click on these real quick. Splice protector sleeves, we have a new slim sleeve available now. If you're using AFL Apex closure or traditional sleeve, you can stack three high. With a new slim sleeve, you can stack it four high and increase the capacity in your Apex closures. Fiber holders. Of course, with a splicer, you get a set of 12 fiber holders, but if you want to do one or 900 or 250, you would want to buy those accessories also. We also have pinch conversion fiber holders to allow you to splice a 200 micron fiber to 250 micron legacy fiber. Uh, accessories for Fuse Connect kits, uh, that's available as well. I hate to be running quickly through these, but uh, we're getting short on time and I don't want to uh, hold you guys over in the field too long. Fiber separation tool, available to extract a single fiber out of a 12 fiber fixed matrix array. Of course, if you're using a spider web ribbon, rollable ribbon, uh, this tool is uh, not needed. You can simply pick and pluck the fiber out of that ribbon array. Fiber arrangement tools, uh, this is our glue method, where you actually use an adhesive to glue the fiber matrix together. And of course, if you're doing a ribbonized 200 micron, you have to use a, a, a glueless method. And this is the RTO2 to basically convert a 250 micron, 200 micron fiber to a 250 micron pitch. So that is also available for you. A V group cleaning kit we discussed in detail earlier. Not going to cover it much now. Support wanted to cover this because uh, it's not if there's a problem, it's when there's a problem, how you address that. Onboard uh, video reference guides are available to you. These are actually stored on the splicing system themselves. Uh, PC software and instruction manual is available to you. 
And finally, oh, very important to us because we take great pride in this, 24-7 uh, uh, technical support and uh, support staff and repair technicians and engineers, whatever we can do to make your job easier in the field. Awesome. So uh, we got a few more questions here. So uh, can you give a brief uh, differences between our uh, flagship, flagship products of 90R versus 90S uh, plus and also 45S, which is newly released in the market right now? I can tell you uh, from development of the active profile alignment system, our 90S, our flagship fusion splicer, that machine, if you want that ultimate low loss splice, you know, a dot 101, dot 02, 100, 200 of a DB splice, or if you're a contractor and you don't know what your next job would be, these are very important system to have because it will splice just about anything with great optical characteristics, the ultimate low loss splice. A mass fusion splicer where you're doing 12 fibers at a time, you're gonna sacrifice a little bit of that optical quality, but what you're going to gain is productivity. You're going to be able to do 144 fibers in less than an hour. Uh, you certainly wouldn't be able to do that with a single fiber active profile alignment system. And then the new 3545, I uh, strongly recommend you go to the website, look at that product overview in those videos. We have a new uh, sheet clamp mechanism in play that allows dual strip, dual cleave, and dual load and it frees up one of your hands so you don't even have to close your sheet clamp, sheet clamp clamp anymore. You can just load that with one hand. I certainly think the next iteration of uh, mass, uh, uh, excuse me, or active profile alignment system will incorporate that feature. Uh, let's uh, hope that, that that moves forward. Yes, awesome. So uh, do we have a, uh, any equipment which works with uh, splicing rare adult uh, active fibers? Uh, certainly the 90S has some of those capabilities and that gets into specialty splicing. When you're talking about rare earth or earth, earthy and dope fiber, uh, it has uh, characteristics that you have to adjust your pre-fuse time, your arc power, your stuff amounts. Uh, all that stuff is uh, controllable within the 90S. And that certainly would be the system you should consider for that type of application. Awesome, thank you. And uh, I'll answer this question. Basically, how resistant to bumps or drops in the equipment? I would say there is. Uh, there have been demos given where they drop our machines uh, from table down, and it survives. And they have been tested uh, uh, in the factory when the uh, before we send it out. So uh, our products are pretty pretty good and. Uh, uh, resisting to the bumps or the drops, uh, I guess that's correct. Yeah, I've actually used that during product presentations. If a customer is known to want to know how durable the machine was, would be I would accidentally drop it on the uh, conference room table and skid it across the uh, the floor for them and everybody go, oh, Lord, and, but we pick it up and make a great splice. So they are extremely durable. And I see there have been there have been questions uh, on uh, bubbles or the cleaving problems. Uh, I would say that would be basically if any of the parts are removed and they are not being calibrated by our uh, tech team. I would strongly recommend to send it to our uh, technical support team so that uh, the cleavers can be recalibrated uh, for its uh, perfect use, so that all the stages are exactly in the same state. I'll, again, when we're talking about bubbles, and I'll, I'll re reiterate what I said earlier, uh, bubbles, uh, you got to be real careful with that one. That's when you really need to have that standard fiber that you have used in the past that you've spliced 100 times successfully. Have a little bit of that fiber sitting in your splice case. So if you're starting getting bubbles, you need to take the fiber that you're splicing that day out of the equation use that standard and if the problem goes away, it may be something related to the glass you're trying to splice and may have to make some adjustments to the parameters uh, to in order to be successful with that. But that gets into what I call peeling the layers of the onion. And sometimes that takes time. Use that technical support line that you see on the screen today. And we certainly want to support you 
when you, again, not if you have a problem, it's when you have a problem, how that's addressed. And most of the questions for your uh, calibration or any others should be in your machines right there. So you have uh, all the videos loaded already preloaded in all your machines. So you can use that as the great resource. And, uh, and there are many more questions online, but uh, uh, as uh, we don't have much of the uh, time, so I would say, uh, please reach us out uh, uh, to our Spicer technical support line if you guys have any problem uh, or any questions. And uh, all our products are available, what we showed today and also uh, future products. Please uh, hop into our airfieldglobal.com for finding all the products and uh, product spec sheets. And also uh, we have many uh, resources there which can be used uh, to learn more about our products or just white papers or anything. And to end with, uh, we do we can provide uh, a certificate of completion for this one as a participation. And uh, this entire uh, webinar will be uh, sent in your emails uh, as a recorded option. So uh, I would end with saying thank you for everyone uh, for participating into this webinar. Uh, we will be doing this webinars frequently. Uh, keep uh, looking for that email and join us uh, for the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and uh, reach out to us.